Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Weekly for Saturday, December 31st, 2022. It's been another great week of shows with great topics and, of course, great guests. We kick off the week discussing investors like me helping underrepresented identities invest. Let's take a look. So we have a mission at The Motley Fool to make the world smarter, happier, and richer. And the Investors Like Me uh, interview series is in line with this. We started it at the beginning of the year. It's an ongoing series, and it spotlights investors who are from historically underrepresented groups. So think uh, people of color, women, LGBTQ plus folks, young people, et cetera. And our goal is to work towards advancing a more representative and inclusive investing space for everybody. I love these interviews. I mean, you can read in them how investors got started, what their relationship with money was like when they were growing up, advice they've got for newer investors, favorite educational resources, and a lot more. And in addition to me, we just uh, spotlighted two other Motley Fool analysts who are my colleagues and I'm great friends with, Emily Flippin and Alice Lumax. Uh, they're fantastic interviews. The other thing that I wanted to just um, put in there, plug for, for this series, is <laughs> the past interviews with external uh, luminaries from The Motley Fool. So we've got, I'm going to read this list here. It's great. Damien Peters, who's founder of Wealth Noir. Gargi Chaudhry, who is a managing director at BlackRock, and Bo Ren, who is director of early stage startups at Silicon Valley Investment Bank, one of the companies I'm really interested in uh, in the coming year, a very fun company. You can find these on and more at fool.com. You know, I'm a child of the 1970s and 80s. My parents emigrated to the U.S. in the late 1960s. I was born in Springfield, Massachusetts, so first-generation uh, American. And uh, my dad is a retired physician. My mom was a homemaker who spent a lot of time with me and my sister and also worked in my dad's office. So maybe not an atypical immigrant story and not atypical in the sense that we didn't have a, a really well thought out, educated view of money. My father earned pretty well as I was growing up, but investing wasn't part of our family history. And we were sort of learning as we went along as a family. There were many ups and downs in my parents' investing career. And, and I was fortunate that we didn't struggle but at the same time, it didn't mean that I came out of the end of the process, this very knowledgeable person about investing who is ready to set the world on fire. Narrative is how we learn in, in many ways, especially in the investing world. And I think that the words of Tacitus, who is a Roman philosopher, are really appropriate here. And those words, one of the many really great epigrams he's known for is, nothing human is foreign to me. So the stories of underrepresented folks are just one lens through which we can tell a story that's universal. Whether you're part of a represented group or a historically underrepresented group, we all have a very interesting path in how we learn to deal with money and investing, growing wealth. And so I think it just brings a very interesting way to look at something we all face and we all deal with, was how do I make uh, money? How do I use it in my life to, to be healthy and happy? How do I grow that uh, pie once it starts accumulating? Um, so, and that's why I like these stories because they're from people who oftentimes are grappling with money issues and investing, not from a position of privilege, but from a position of trying to figure the whole thing out. And at some point in our lives, whether you're privileged or not, you'll reach a point where you're trying to figure this game out. Next up, we discussed the SECURE Act. It's on its way. Let's take a look. It's a very exciting time here at Corporate Financial. And while we're a new company with a new name, we're not a new business. We're one of the largest providers of retirement solutions and life insurance products in the U.S. And for more than half a century, Corbridge has served as a leading provider of retirement plans and services to employees in the tax exempt and public sector. So while we were known as AIG Retirement Services, we're now known and going to market as Corbridge Financial. And if you really break apart the name Corbridge, you start with core, and that really represents the products that we deliver, the solutions, the partnerships that we have in order to help people with their financial lives. And the second part is the bridge 
which really is aimed at evoking the passion that we all have for helping people to take action in their financial lives and planning. And the difference between just planning and actually creating the outcomes is the action. So at Corbridge Financial, we believe very strongly that action is everything. Jeff, there's no doubt that we're we're dealing with very challenging times. We certainly have had a lot of volatility in the markets. We've we're seeing con- uh, continued rate increases by the by the Fed, and that certainly um, you know puts people on on a bit of edge. Um, you know, they're also dealing in their day to day lives with with inflation, and that's really what you know, the Fed is trying to tackle, um, but that also has impacts on their ability to save as well as their savings and the value of their savings. And we see that again, as you mentioned, in the volatility. You know, what we focus on is helping um, our plan sponsors make sure that they have the right services, they have the right education, they have the right fund lineups, you know, working with their consultants to make sure that they have good diversified fund lineups for their participants to then take advantage of. As it relates to plan participants, we focus on helping those participants with their overall wellness, working with our financial professionals, the ability to make sure that they engage with their portfolio. You know, it's not a one size fits all, and there's an opportunity to make sure that uh, participants take advantage of the tools that we give them. We are seeing definitely a shift in plan sponsors and their view towards call it the bigger picture of their employees' financial wellness and their financial well-being. And, you know, the, we, we know that, you know, employees who have financial stress don't bring themselves, their whole selves to work. And they worry about their, you know, their personal situation and that impacts their ability to get their jobs done. And employers know that and they talk to us about that and they look for us to be able to bring services that, really focus on the financial wellness of their employees. And that includes being able to have services that focus on basic financial literacy, as well as how people deal with budgeting, deal with debt. You know, a major challenge we see, especially among our uh, participant population, is student loan debt, as well as emergency funds. So we believe that it's not just about the workplace retirement plan anymore. It's about making sure that participants have those services. And that's what our plan sponsors are are asking of us and looking for us to deliver both online as well as in person and person to person when a um, when a when a participant um, or an employee is looking for help. Well we're halfway through the best segments for the week. We come back, we look at the other half of our best segments. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN Weekly. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network.
Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and call Credit Repair for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit Repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Nothing is known 100%. So my strategy does not change based off what other people expect. My strategy is based off of what I expect. And what I expect is to retire when I'm around 60 years old. And so I make my investments today based off what my future goal is, which is, you know, to retire in you know, 30 or 40 years. That's, that's my goal. Great things don't happen by accident. No one just blew out a candle and turned on a light bulb. Great things happen with action. And when it comes to financial security, the same truth applies. You want to feel excited about your future and see things you never thought possible? Action makes it possible. At Corbridge Financial, we proudly partner with financial professionals and institutions to help more people take action in their financial lives. Welcome back. Next up, we discuss detecting and treating dementia let's take a look so the honest answer is the older you are the higher your risk for almost all dementias with an exception of a certain type called frontal temporal or certain inherited dementias but in general uh, as we age our risk goes up so if you're alive and you're aging uh every year you're alive your risk is a little higher yeah so and after age 65 you're in a high risk category. And by 85, uh, estimates are somewhere between 30 to 50% of us will experience some significant changes in our brain that would constitute the beginning of a dementia. Because it turns out for half of, just about half of everyone who gets a dementia, one of the first changes that happens in your brain is in the front of your brain where you keep track of what I can do, what I can't do, and what I might be having some differences in doing. And it turns out for half of everyone who gets dementia, that part gets damaged early on, which means I'm not going to be accurate in my awareness of myself. So for half of people, I'm the first one that says something is not right. I can't find words. I'm, I'm getting lost. I, I I lose my temper really fast. Um, I, I can't remember things that have, people have told me and I know I can't. And I've never been like this before. I can't make my checkbook work. For the other half of folks, we've got to rely on other people because um, unfortunately, my brain tells me I'm fine. I can do it as well as I've ever done it. If there's a problem, it's not me. So it makes it hard. And it's actually got a term. It's called anisognosia, the inability to be self-aware. And it's sort of a unique disease for this reason. I mean, half of us won't actually recognize and it causes lots of challenges. The latest thinking is um, it could be viral in nature. In other words, over time, we're susceptible to various viral loads and we get to a certain point. It could be based on inflammation or infections that the blood brain barrier. Um, we have lots of thoughts about it, but we're still they're still investigating causes because there's actually we currently think over 120 forms, causes and types of dementia. So it's not all one thing. It's not all Alzheimer's or all Lewy body or all frontal temporal or the one you mentioned, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, fancy words for a, a condition that results from little traumas to your brain or one big one over time. And I think what happens is we sort of slide into it too often. Nobody really talks about it until you're in the middle of it and you realize this is just getting worse. I'm not sure how to manage this. Um, so it turns out about 80 to 
close to 80 percent, 70 to 80 percent of all care provided to people living with dementia is provided by friends, family and informal carers. So that's a lot of care. And it means a lot of it's non reimbursed. A lot of it is um, what you do without thinking at first. And then it starts to wear away. It wears on relationships, too. I mean, it makes it incredibly difficult to love someone that you love when you're arguing or fighting about things or you can't get them to understand and they can't get you to believe. And so there's so many conflicts that arise because we don't actually, people don't actually understand what's happening to the person's brain and therefore their behavior and their emotions and their thinking. It makes it really challenging for sure. And finally, we discussed the latest trends when it comes to state and local governments. Let's take a look. So we've been polling state and local workers um, especially over the past two years as we've gone through through the pandemic. And we've been asking a range of questions about how they're feeling about their job outlook, how they're feeling about the broader economy, how they're feeling about uh, the benefits that they're offered and the compensation they're offered. Um, these are state local workers uh, via their, their, their public employment. And back in, uh, in the September timeframe, uh, we really uh, wanted to dive into how, as you mentioned, economic volatility, Inflation, other you know, top of mind uh, issues were affecting state and local workers, and quite frankly, they're not immune from from what the rest of uh, of, of, of Americans are dealing with uh, you know, throughout the course of 2022. Um, 84 uh, percent had noted in that most recent survey that they were anxious uh, by the economic uh, volatility, uh, um, economic conditions, market volatility, inflation. Uh, and as it relates, I guess, to, to those of, of your viewers uh, listening to this in terms of retirement, 58% um, really viewed their retirement benefits as being a key piece to uh, keeping them on the job, retaining, enabling their employers to retain them going forward. And I would just also probably touch on that uh, in terms of higher inflation, uh, a little over half uh, said that uh, the higher inflation was causing them to save less for retirement. At the same time, a little over a third uh, uh, reported that that higher housing costs were, were uh, uh, causing them to save less for retirement. So they're not immune to a lot of the outside macro pressures that all Americans are dealing with, but it's something that we keep an eye on uh, from the Mission Square research. And I will say um, thank you for bringing up the trends piece. We're going to be releasing it um, uh, very shortly. And we've been doing this for many years now in terms of where we look at the research that we've done over the past year. And in any given year, and and look to see how it informs our outlook going forward. And so, when you talk about communicating the full the full value of both uh, uh, portfolio of benefits being offered to public employees via their public employers, um, we see this a lot not only in our survey data but in our focus group work, where public employers who are an are able to recruit and retain individuals really are attempting to communicate what from a holistic perspective, they're offering uh, from a benefits uh, uh, um, angle. So, for example, you know, we all know, many of your viewers know, uh, main components of non-wage compensation are retirement benefits and health care benefits. Um, you know, on the defined benefit side, about 86% of uh, state and local employees have access to uh, a DV plan uh, in 2021. It's been relatively stable over the past decade. On the defined contribution side, primary defined contribution side, uh, about 38% have access to a primary defined benefit plan. This is up about eight or nine percentage points from about a decade ago. So you're seeing growth in the DC on the DC side. That's something to keep an eye on. On the healthcare side, we're, we're seeing a lot of stability in terms of access to healthcare, access to healthcare in service and, and retirees, uh, and for retirees. And then I guess more more generally. We're seeing a lot more focus on what's what we consider non-traditional or quality of life benefits are. So uh, enhanced employee assistance programs, uh, enhanced financial wellness programs that are offered by public employers. And we're seeing interest, maybe not so much movement, but we're seeing interest in uh, what else can be done to round out the benefits package uh, from subsidized commuting, subsidized child care, uh, student loan repayment options, these sort of things. And I think uh, public employers of all sizes are looking at what the optimal benefits package is 
for recruiting and retaining individuals at different stages of their career. Traditionally, you know, let's say something like retirement benefits have been geared toward helping to recruit a workforce that is interested in making a career of state or local government. You know, they have to wait a certain number of years before they're vested, and obviously a, a certain number of years beyond that uh, to retire on the um, contributions that have been made on their behalf. But there are a number of people out there that are interested in government as a, uh, a short-term job. It might be two years or four years, who knows? Uh, and appealing to that group as well, uh, you know, part of that is identifying the benefits that are going to resonate for them, as Josh indicated. Uh, but it's also a matter of how you reach out to them. It might not be simply putting the job description online and saying, OK, you know, mission accomplished. It might be figuring out, well, OK, for this demographic, uh, do I need to do maybe a video uh, advertisement? Do I need to do it on social media? Uh, do I want to work through other groups, third parties? Uh, you know, the colleges are an obvious uh, audience, but also the uh, military communities and the bases where people might be either retiring from the military or their family members might be looking for work. Uh, or do you need to look at, and you know, many are, um, either specific neighborhoods within their community uh, to really uh, have that homegrown aspect of people working and you know, making a difference in that community or advertising in you know, specialty media like non-English language publications. Uh, and with all of those things, you know, as you're advertising for a position, not simply relying on the job description as it was written 20 years ago, but figuring out what in that job description is out of date, uh, what you know, prerequisites really aren't relevant anymore, uh, and how can really uh, that job description be, you know, turned on its head, away from, you know, this is what you're required to do, and this is the more bureaucratic level of task that you might be involved in, but what can you accomplish in this job, and what satisfaction can you get from this job in terms of being of public service, which is really one of the key motivators for a lot of people who are deciding between, you know, an IT job in the private sector and an IT job in the public sector where they're going to be making that difference on the community level. You know, there have always been, you know, smaller pools uh, like those who are drawn to work in healthcare or public safety uh, who will continue to gravitate toward those fields. But yes, there are plenty of people who you know, might be recruited for public or private sector positions. And that's where it's so crucial that, you know, the messaging is consistent with the demographic groups, uh, plural, not singular, that you're trying to pull from. It could be people who are just out of college, or it could be people who are looking at a second career. So on the public pension side, um, I know that we've talked in the past about the public plans database, which is a collaborative effort between our institute, uh, the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College, the Government Finance Office Association, and the National Association of State Retirement Administrators. Publicplansdata.org, uh, any of your viewers are, are more than welcome to, to visit it and, and, and explore the data. It's the largest public pension database out there. It represents about 95% of all public pension members and assets, about 200 largest uh, state and local pension systems around the country. And what this has allowed us to do over, over time is track sort of funded funder ratios of, of, in the aggregate or individual plans, um, contributions, investment returns of these, these plans. And, and I think that as I talked to you at the end of 2022, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting story where you see in the aggregate, public pension plans are about 75% funded, have a funded ratio of about 75%. Uh, um, this is up from immediately following the Great Recession. Now, a lot of regarding the market volatility, a lot of the impacts of, of the market volatility, especially earlier this year, because public pension uh, plans typically phase in their gains and losses over time, um, you'll likely see that accounted for in going forward in 2023, 2024, 2025. Um, at the same time, when we reflect back on the past, quite frankly, two decades, um, or, or longer, three decades, I should say, um, uh, these pension systems have exceeded 
their expectations for investment returns 19 years out of the past 30. And, and at the same time, um, when we when we look at the pension systems as a whole in the aggregate and, or break them out in terms of quintiles, um, across all categories in the aggregate, um, uh, the systems are receiving 92% of their employer uh, contributions, and that has gone up for most most quintiles over time. So, so you're seeing more public employers make a, a more uh, dedicated, uh, concerted effort to pay their their as close to as full as their required contributions as is possible. Um, and, and it'll be interesting to keep an eye on that going forward because that really positions uh, these plans well going forward. I will say one other thing: um, we've added a a new component probably in the past year or so, of defined contribution plans to the public plans database. Right now we have about some about 100 of the largest uh, the defined contribution plans around the, from around the country. We're gonna be expanding that going forward. And I would encourage any of your, your, your viewers to go and, and take a look at that database as we add to it as well. So we're trying to really provide a snapshot for individual years, but then also for longer term uh, trends uh, for not only DB plans, but also defined contribution. Well, great segments. I want to thank all of our great contributors this week. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. Have a topic of interest, somebody you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest news in retirement, markets, technology, personal finance, so much more, and all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content, we'll visit our website, and of course, all of our streaming partners. We're back again tomorrow for another edition of BRN Sunday. I'll be joined by members of the media, academia, financial services, and government as we analyze all the news and events for the week. And I dare say that's the end of BRN for this year. It's the end of 2022. We look forward to serving you and providing you the latest important content for 2023. On behalf of everyone at the network, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Tax audits, tax liens, wage garnishments. Every day we hear stories like this about good folks who are simply struggling to pay their bills. Each of them are living a frightening IRS tax nightmare and they are afraid it will destroy their lives. I'm a divorced single mom and my ex-husband left me and the kids with a lot of unpaid bills, including unpaid taxes. I was really starting to show my stress on my kids because the IRS had sent me a letter demanding a huge payment from me. I couldn't afford it. So then the IRS was threatening to garnish my wages. I'm already living paycheck to paycheck. That would have put me over the edge financially. It truly seemed hopeless, but then a friend at work told her to call the tax relief line. The people at the tax relief line, they told me about something called innocent spouse relief. They worked it out so that all of the taxes from my ex are not my problem. I don't know how that works and, and I don't care. All I care about is that I don't owe the IRS a dime and they are not going to take my paycheck. Even if it seems hopeless, you should call the number on your screen right now. There is absolutely no cost for the call or the consultation. You are under no obligation. If you are worried that the IRS could garnish your wages, seize your assets, even take your home, call us right now. The Tax Relief Line is here to help you. Now you have a knowledgeable, professional team of tax experts that are ready to negotiate with the IRS and fight for you to save you money. The Tax Relief Line's professionals have successfully negotiated thousands of cases, reducing and sometimes even eliminating the tax debt for their clients. 
it's very easy to get started. Simply call the number on your screen right now. You don't have to live in fear anymore. The call and the consultation are free.